Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. John Shrigley, the clinical lead for Cancer Care Ontario Synoptic Pathology Project and also the uh, lead for the Synoptic Pathology Project for the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. On behalf of Cancer Care Ontario, the Partnership, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's education session on the new CAP checklist related to malignant melanoma, which will be presented by Dr. Mark Trotter. Before I introduce the speaker and we get underway formally, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Firstly, today's presentation will be approximately 90 minutes in length and will include a 60-minute presentation time followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers. The session is being recorded and will be made available to all participants via email links once the recording becomes available. Both the live presentation and recorded presentations are eligible for CME credits upon completion and submission of the evaluation form is available electronically. The information for accessing the evaluation form was provided in the notice for the session previously distributed. Please note CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education sessions will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. The recorded sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, but CME certificates will only be issued for one month. Please refer to the session notice for the exact deadline date. Please note that everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. Due to the large number of participants, we are unable to troubleshoot any WebEx connectivity issues as part of this call. If you're having difficulties accessing the WebEx portion of the teleconference, please call WebEx support line at 1-866-229-3239. You are welcome to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature. For instructions on how to use the WebEx chat window, please refer to the documentation previously distributed. During the question and answer portion of the presentation, in order to avoid question collisions, I will pose the submitted questions on your behalf as long as time permits and in the order in which they appear. In the chat window, please include the following information, your institution's name, the name of the individual posing the question, and finally, your question. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Trotter. Martin is a graduate of the University of British Columbia with an MD and PhD. He did his anatomical pathology residency at UBC, and then he did a dermatopathology fellowship in London for a year at St. John's Institute of Dermatology. Martin has a diploma in derm dermatopathology from the Royal College of Pathologists in the UK. He started practicing at Vancouver General Hospital in 1994 and moved to Calgary in 2000. Between 2002 and 2008, he was the division head of anatomical pathology and cytopathology and has been the division head and currently is the division head of immunohistochemistry. Martin is an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and in the Department of Oncology at the University of Calgary. His research interests are skin cancer, especially melanoma, and also workload and QA issues in the laboratory. It is now my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Martin Trotter. Martin? Thanks, John. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks very much for the participation. I'm looking forward to uh, some good interactions today. Hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'm going to talk about the melanoma protocol. And first of all, I need to uh, make a few disclosures. I don't have any uh, financial relationships. And although there's a slight, uh, small little piece on some molecular issues, I won't be talking about any investigational drugs. So let's look at uh, the learning objectives, what we want to accomplish today. Uh, the protocol is fairly detailed, so we need to understand how the components uh, relate to cancer staging and prognosis. Um, there's been changes since the last edition, since the sixth edition, so we, we need to um, learn those. And then there's certainly some uncertainties in reporting components of the melanoma checklist. And I, I don't think I have all the answers for you, but I want to show you those uncertainties and challenges. And uh, at the end, we'll also review sentinel lymph node biopsy and how to report those since that's part of the CAP protocol. So College of American Pathologists, this is the protocol for examination of specimens with melanoma of the skin. And it's cutaneous surfaces only, so we're not talking about mucosal surfaces today or any other melanoma primary sites. You'll see that the, um, that the protocol web posting date is October 2009. So it's uh, just a little bit over a year old. And it relates to the biopsy procedure, or the procedure such as biopsy, excision, sentinel node, and regional node exam. Uh, 
So here's my quick and dirty summary of the cap melanoma protocol, excluding the lymph node portion, just the uh, cutaneous site. And I think to create, we'll go through all of these um, parts of the protocol, but I think you'll see that the clinical information covers some of it, the growth examination of the specimen covers some, and, and then what we do down the microscope covers the majority of the indicators uh, under the pathologic exam. Now I want to point out that the, uh, there really only are four things in the protocol that affect staging. So uh, Breslow thickness, ulceration, mitotic index, and the presence or absence of satellites. And everything else, uh, clearly important, things like margins and site laterality, uh, but they're not actually part of the AJCC staging um, criteria. So keep that in mind because the emphasis will be on the items that are in red. So let's start with the procedure. Um, we have to report the procedure, and sometimes we know that because the clinicians told us, and sometimes we have no clue and we have to uh, discern it from the shape of the biopsy. But it's either going to be a shape biopsy, a punch biopsy, incisional biopsy, or some type of excision, ideally an excisional biopsy. And then you get a re-excision um, of a previously biopsied lesion. So wh why are we getting these biopsies from uh, patients with malignant melanoma that are only partial? Why would a clinician be doing a partial biopsy? Well, excluding just because they're trying to get as many patients through as possible and doing quick shaves, they, some of them do have good reasons for doing partial biopsies. Often it's just no, no suspicion of melanoma. Thought it was a nevus, thought it was a pyogenic granuloma, uh, thought it was maybe a mildly dysplastic nevus. But there are certain anatomic sites, for example, that you won't often get full excisional biopsies to start off with. Uh, for example, um, there's a picture on there of the distal digit. You can see the incision, uh, where the incisional biopsy was done to make the diagnosis. But you can imagine you're not going to get that specimen right from the beginning without a um, definite diagnostic biopsy preceding it. So face and ear and acral sites, palm soles, subungal lesions often get partial biopsies, including punch biopsies. And then very large lesions, that's where we often get punch biopsies from. Big lesion, uh, and uh, a general practitioner, for example, will take two punch biopsies rather than try to excise a large lesion. So there, there's no evidence that disrupting a primary melanoma makes any difference to the prognosis, but we're not seeding cells or uh, pushing cells into lymphatics or anything like that. But there are two problems. I think the most important one um, from the diagnosis point of view is underdiagnosis of melanoma. So when we get partial biopsies of melanocytic lesions, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of this, um, it's dangerous stuff uh, trying to rule out melanoma on partial biopsies especially with a little bit of atypia. And it's very, very easy to call something mildly atypical or even benign when it's really part of a, a larger lesion and you weren't given appropriate information. So that's the biggest problem. Recent paper talks about that, that if you assess lesions with punch or shave, you have usually underdiagnosis of melanoma. And then from our point of view, in terms of these criteria we have to report, uh, there's a problem with microstaging. So um, punch biopsies, of course, are random, almost random samples of a melanoma. They try to presumably biopsy the darkest part or the thickest part, and, but they may not be representative. And so a punch biopsy with a Breslow thickness doesn't mean that's the final Breslow thickness in a melanoma. And shave biopsy, I think, are very, very common. Um, our Alberta database is probably up around 30 to 40 percent of shave biopsies have a, have a positive deep margin uh, of, of melanoma, and the literature would, would uh, go along with that, 22 to 50 percent of shave biopsies have a positive deep margin. And you'll see that creates, clearly does create problems in staging uh, because you can't report an accurate Breslow thickness and you don't know how much tumor is behind uh, in, the, in the patient. So um, I'll show you how, how one suggestion how to report those positive deep margins, but they do have implications, as you'll see, for patient treatment and what clinicians want to do with the patient. So we won't talk much more about clinical information and growth examination there on the left because a lot of that, that uh, information is coming straight on the requisition. The growth examination part of the protocol, tumor size, is usually in wide excision specimens, as are microscopic satellites. Um, I'll talk to you about how when we diagnose satellites, we have to confirm that pathologically anyway. 
and then the macroscopic pigmentation is just in your growth description. So we're going to move on to the uh, criteria that are described under pathologic examination of the primary melanoma. So this is the list in order on the CAP checklist. Histologic type, maximum tumor thickness, anatomic level, ulcerations, margins, mitotic index, microsatellitosis, lymphascular invasion, perineural invasion, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, tumor regression, growth phase, and additional pathologic findings. So let's look at the T uh, classification for primary cutaneous melanoma. It's, it's fairly simple and straightforward, isn't it? The, uh, the classification is just T1 to T4 based on breast load thickness. So T1 lesions are less than or equal to a millimeter of thickness. T2 are between 1 and 2. T3 between 2 and 4. T4 greater than 4. So although there's no natural breakpoints in the melanoma prognosis with breast load thickness, these are these have been chosen um, partly for simplicity and partly because they fit prognostic and staging groups. But for us as pathologists, it's pretty easy to remember that those um, measurements. And then the other big part of T classification is ulceration status. So if a melanoma is ulcerated, it's a, a B class classification. If it's not ulcerated, it's A. So an ulcerated T2 lesion is T2B. And now we'll find out now that we've changed from using Clark level to mitotic rate as an, uh, another criteria for subdividing the T1 group into T1A and T1B, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> for regional lymph nodes, and I won't be talking about the M classification, but for regional lymph nodes, the N classification, it's N1 to N3, pretty well based on the number of metastatic nodes with N1 being one node, N2, two to three, and N3 greater than or equal to four. And um, again, we'll see later on, it's divided into micromets versus macromets, or clinically um, evident metastasis. But really important for us as pathologists when we're signing out wide excisions of uh, primary cutaneous melanoma is the presence of satellite lesions in that skin excision specimen. I'm sure you all know this because this isn't a change from the previous AJCCC. AJCC classification, but it's really important. If satellites are present in the skin excision without metastatic nodes, it's still an N classification. So it seems counterintuitive. We don't even have a lymph node yet, and we're calling it N2C. Um, but that's, that's why looking for satellites is so important, because satellites are in transit nets, basically have the same prognostic implication as two to three nodes involved by metastatic melanoma. So this is the list again, and what I've done is highlighted the important, uh, prognostically important components of the CAP checklist. We will talk about all the other ones as well, but we need to deal with the ones that are involved in prognosis. Margins, of course, is not a prognostic, directly a prognostic indicator, but it's intrinsic to doing surgical pathology to report margins, so we will talk about that as well. So let's start with uh, maximum tumor thickness. Breslow thickness. So Breslow thickness uh, is measured in millimeters. Um, you really need to use uh, a calibrated ocular micrometer to do this. Yeah, we occasionally pick up a big nodular melanoma that's seven millimeters deep or something like that and can use a ruler just on the slide, but you really need to do this down the microscope, so make sure we have calibrated ocular micrometers if we're reporting melanoma. Straightforward, usually measuring from the top of the granular layer to the deepest point of tumor invasion. So in this example, it would be a 2.67 uh, millimeter melanoma. I would recommend, um, I've only seen a few references about it, but I would recommend trying where possible to use two decimal places. Um, because the cutoffs around the um, one and two and four millimeter marks depend on that, you know, you really, if you just call something 2.9 or 1.1, it doesn't really say exactly whether you're rounding it up or down or whatever. So if it's 0.95, it's 0.95. If it's 1.02, it's 1.02. And try to use where, where you can as accurately as you can two decimal points, realizing, of course, that there's other variables that affect breadth of thickness. 
So we all know breast milk thickness uh, is uh, tumor thickness is probably one of the most is the most important prognostic variable in primary melanoma. Here's the um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve with the T1 lesions at the top and the T4 lesions at the bottom, and you can see the <clears throat> dramatic difference in survival based on uh, staging and tumor thickness. Well, there's some problems measuring breast milk thickness. It, most of the time, it's straightforward, but Often we have to make interpretations and, and do our best with um, with problem situations. Let's just go to the bottom one on this list, which is microsatellites. Um, we can eliminate that used to be a problem. People trying to decide whether to include microsatellites in the Breslow thickness. You can we can strike that off our list because microsatellites immediately upstage it to a, an N2C uh, staging. So it, it does, shouldn't you shouldn't be incorporating that in the Breslow thickness at all. And I'll show you an example. Tumor ulceration, um, the rule is to measure from the base of the ulcer, recognizing, of course, that we're underestimating the true depth, but that ulceration has a poor prognostic indicator by itself and has already upstaged them to a, usually to a higher stage anyway. I've just drawn an imaginary line across the top. You don't need to do that. You don't need to extrapolate across the top. We just measure from the base to the bottom. So in general, ulceration is straightforward. I find epidermal hyperplasia a lot more problematic, and I'm sure you've seen cases, especially when there's a lot of in situ component like this one, where the um, epidermis is very hyperplastic. And I've drawn three possible lines into the dermis here, and I'm not sure I can tell you which is the right way to measure um, the Breslow thickness. Remember, the rule for Breslow thickness is that you measure uh, at right angles to the surface, but this surface angulation is varying you know, 90 degrees as you go around, so it's very problematic to, to um, measure the thickness. What my recommendation here would be to measure the thickness as best you can and, me and mention that um, it's, uh, it's still a relatively shallow lesion within the dermis, and a lot of the breast cell thickness includes epidermal hyperplasia. But that's the uh, recommended approach at the moment. Well, we know that the in situ component, a lot of melanomas can extend down at nexal structures. For example, here's a hair follicle with melanoma encircling it and tracking down. And it becomes a problem if you get invasion out of this in situ component. So deep in the dermis, you have a, a nodule of melanoma coming off the hair follicle. And there's been lots of approaches to that. Do you measure from the granular layer all the way down to the bottom? Do you measure from the hair follicle in out to the outside? Um, I think the best thing to do is, is just say exactly what you did. So measure the main bulk of the melanoma and then measure this deep focus, assuming it's deeper, and say this is a ne an nexal extension focus and likely doesn't represent the true Breslow thickness. The reason for mentioning two, I think, is because biologically this can be quite deep, maybe even right down into fat, and perhaps has a implications both for the surgery and for access to um, vascular drainage. So Although it, it probably you don't include the deep focus in the true Breslow thickness, I would always have it in the report that there's a ad nexal extension invasive focus at what depth it is. And finally, uh, maybe I just didn't recognize them before, but I, I find there's a lot more nevoid melanomas, older people, antigenous nevoid melanoma, and there's sometimes the distinction between melanoma and coexisting or underlying nevus is, is really problematic. And this is an example of a, of a case with a lot of melanoma on the left side of the slide and, and then benign nevus on the right side. And where those two merge, it becomes quite problematic in terms of determining what the actual true depth is. Uh, there's, there's things you can do. I mean, you could try HMB45 staining, for example, which might stain the melanoma strongly and would stain the nevus negative, but that doesn't always help you. And, I think you just have to make the best estimate possible and, and say why you did it. So I can determine that there's atypical cells to this depth and that it merges with a benign appearing component. So those are the things I think many of us have trouble with when measuring a Breslow thickness. Well, what happened to Clark level? I put it in a little print here because although Clark level is something we're supposed to put in the CAP protocol, it's no longer in the staging. So just to remind ourselves, the Clark level um, was used before in lesions that were a millimeter or less, 
And if they were Clark level four, they were upstaged to T1B. And that's no longer the case. So and now you would use the mitotic rate to upstage to T1B in a non-ulcerated melanoma. And part of the problem, of course, was poor pathologist reproducibility. We were, had a lot of trouble distinguishing level three from level four and level two from level three. And Clark level had the lowest statistical correlation with survival rate. So here's the multivariate Cox regression analysis and Clark levels, um, a statistically significant variable, but you can see it's uh, much less significant than the other six variables mentioned there. So that's the reason Clark level was dropped. There might be a rare circumstance where Clark level can be used for staging. I'm not really going to talk about it because I can't think of really good examples, but when we talk about mitotic rate, if you can't measure mitotic rate for whatever reason, poorly preserved tissue or something like that, you could use Clark level if it's four to upstage, four or five to upstage it to T1B, but that must be a very rare circumstance. So essentially Clark level is not used in staging anymore. Okay, so we've covered the thickness, uh, including a little bit on Clark level. Let's move on to the ulceration, which uh, hasn't changed from the previous um, staging system other than by definition. So the ulceration status is very important. It changes lesions from A to B and essentially moves them up a staging category in most cases. So a T2B lesion behaves like a T3A lesion in terms of its um, biological behavior. The definition has been more clearly defined <clears throat> based on a few uh, papers. So you need to have a full thickness epidermal defect. In other words, if the stratum corneum is intact over the top, it's not considered ulcer. Uh, and you have to lose the base of membrane. There has to be reactive changes fiber and neutrophils, and there should be some change to the adjacent epidermis uh, in the absence of trauma or recent surgical procedures. So I'll talk a little bit about those problems, because I think there's still major issues in defining tumor ulceration. So this is an ulcerated melanoma, big nodular mass, fiber and neutrophils over the top, no epidermis, that's clearly ulceration. Here's another ulcerated melanoma, big melanoma, lots of inflammatory debris on the top, but most of this has actually got intact epidermis. If you follow the epidermis across from both sides, and it's only right in the middle where there's definite ulceration with just crust and fibrin and debris on top. So that would be an ulcerated melanoma, but it's a pretty small focus, isn't it? Here's another, a different case with what I would consider ulceration, although I, I suppose you could argue that there's a little bit of stratum corneum there. That's a, that's a microscopic focus. So the, the CAP guidelines and the AJCC system don't actually measure the width of the ulceration, although some um, synoptic checklists do include a bracket to put the width in, and any ulceration is considered significant. So here's the problems I have, if you agree. I personally still think it's very difficult to differentiate between uh, true biological ulceration versus uh, traumatic exogenous ulceration. Can you really tell the difference between a ulcerated melanoma that's sitting on a belt line or a bra strap line that's constantly traumatized versus one that's truly biologically ulcerated? And secondly, again, just as we refer to how much is enough, there's no guidelines that I can see at the moment that show definite prognostic significance versus from small compared to large areas of ulceration. So at the moment, any ulceration counts. And then and that, those examples I showed, we often see examples where the there's all kinds of material and crap on the surface of the epidermis and it's hyperplastic and it's clearly reacting to something. How many, how many levels do we have to cut through that block in order to find ulceration? There's no good guidelines on that. Um, the times I have cut levels, I still don't seem to find it. Or if the clinician says it's ulcerated clinically and you get intact epidermis microscopically, what do you do? So uh, I'll leave you with those problems. They're not straightforward. and. Uh, Essentially, we do our best, but it is a very important uh, prognostic variable, so I think these need to be resolved a little bit better. Okay, this is the big change, isn't it, in the new system, um, the mitotic index. So mitotic index, mitotic rate is a really important prognostic variable, and uh, you can see it's more statistically significant than um, everything except tumor thickness. So this is a, this is a big deal. Um, but it's really only used in the staging T classification in T1 lesions. So 
It's important for agnostic variable in terms of database collection and research, but in terms of upstaging or changing the stage of a patient, it's really only important in T1s. So a T1 lesion that's not ulcerated and has mitosis, um, doesn't have any mitosis in the dermis, we'll talk about that in a minute, is a T1A, and if there are mitosis in the dermis, it's a T1B. So it's the second most important indicator, but it only changes the staging for T1. Well, importantly, I think we all know this from other tumor types, we need to report the mitotic rate per millimeter squared. So it's not acceptable for us to use mitotic rate for 10 high power fields or to say very mitotically active or to say we need, we need to be able to know what our field diameter is and what our field area is. So I'm sure you know I'll, I'll know how to care, uh, measure this and to have, have this done for your scope, but each, each microscope you should know your field diameter and just from that field diameter you use a graded, graded slide like that, a graduated slide, you can work out the area. For my microscope there on a 40 times high power, it's um, just a little bit over four high power fields per millimeter squared. So uh, that's an, that, that has to be done if we're going to count mitotic rate in free will every tumor type, certainly melanoma. So how do we do this? Well, these are the instructions, which are actually quite detailed from in the AJCC um, 7th edition manual. It's hot spot counting. So in other words, you <clears throat> go to the area of melanoma where the most mitoses are located. Uh, that's on a lower power scan. And you count, you could then go to high power and count that hot spot field. And then we count adjacent fields until, until an area of one millimeter has been assessed. I need, really need to stress this point because I was very confused about this. How many fields do you have to count? But if you look at the guidelines, they're telling us we only have to count one millimeter around the hot spot. So it's true hot spot counting. It's not an average count over the melanoma starting at a hot spot. It's hot spot counting. And I'm going to go through this in a bit more detail because I think <clears throat> it's confusing to people. And it's probably less arduous than we thought at first and there's no mathematical calculations involved. So that, here's an example. Um, sometimes you don't find a hot spot. You just, you're cruising around, oh, there's a mitosis, mitosis and there's a few scattered around, but there's no accentuation in a certain area. So here's what to do. If there's no hot spot found and they're, they're randomly scattered, just find a representative mitosis. I've indicated that by the black star on this slide. And then count uh, the fields adjacent to it and, until you've counted one millimeter. So in this example, let's say this person's microscope has a field diameter of 0 0.51. You plug that into your formula. You need to count five fields. This is not my scope, for example. Five fields per millimeter squared. And that's the only, you start with that one and you count the other ones and that's the only mitosis you find. It's one mitosis per millimeter squared. In other words, we don't carry on and say, see if we can find another mitosis over here or on the right hand side of the tumor. We only have to find one representative mitosis and count a total of a millimeter squared. That's what the guidelines say. So in this particular example, it's already a T2A lesion. It's 1.6 millimeter lesion. So you're just going to report the mitotic rate, but it doesn't affect the P classification, the T classification, excuse me, at all. What do we do when we can't really accumulate a millimeter of, uh, of melanoma? What's, what's, what's the rules to do? So here's a, a 0.6 millimeter T1 melanoma, and we have to try to look for mitotic, mitotic figures. So the rules are to count a total of a millimeter squared of dermal tissue that includes the tumor. So you can see these five fields here, which add up to a millimeter squared. They encompass both tumor and dermis. And really, if there's no mitosis found in, in the tumor that's available, it'd be, it's zero mitosis per millimeter squared. So the recommendation is don't report it as less than one. Report it as zero. You didn't find any. And at the very most, in order to accumulate the fields of uh, invasive melanoma, at the very most, you can examine two slides with serial sections on them. Don't examine, the rules say don't examine 10, ten slides trying to accumulate a millimeter squared of, of melanoma. And if we find one mitosis, just one, then it's, it's at least one, because you haven't quite counted a full millimeter squared and you found one, so it's at least one per millimeter squared, and immediately upstages it to T1B. So I was a bit confused before, but actually it's pretty simple. 
the phytomitosis in the derma, since you're using hot spot counting, it's going to be at least one. Um, and so any mitosis in the dermis upstages a T1 lesion. And so it becomes pretty simple. T1B lesions have a mitosis. T1A lesions, you didn't find any. Okay, um, microsatellites. <coughs> so remember, again, that satellites in the primary excision specimen are part of the N classification, so they're important components to report on every melanoma. Macroscopic satellites should be described by during grossing. So if you have a resonance or pathology assistance grossing for you, they should be well aware that when they're bread loafing through a large elliptical specimen of a melanoma re-excision, they should be looking for lesions suspicious for macroscopic satellites, pigmented lesions in the dermis or fat or on the skin surface. Um, but I, all of those need to be confirmed microscopically. So um, even though they say there's macroscopic satellites, you can't actually confirm that until you look at them down the scope. As you know, many of them will be a, a blood vessel or some hemorrhage, something like that. And I've certainly had a case where the gross photographs look like it's full of microscopic satellites, or at least several are there, and I just can't find them. Uh, it's full of satellites grossly, but I can't find them down the microscope. So you need to try to confirm them. So the definition of a microsatellite is a discontinuous nest of interlymphatic metastatic cells. I'll come back to that. Greater than 0 0.05 millimeters in diameter, separated by normal dermis from the main invasive component of melanoma by a distance of at least 0 0.3 millimeters. So satellites are, are close to the primary lesion. They're within two centimeters of the primary lesion, whereas in transit nets are beyond two centimeters. I'm a little confused by this definition of intralymphatic, because most of the time when we see satellite lesions, they're extralymphatic. And I would have thought that um, deposits of melanoma within the confines of lymphatic endothelium is lymphascular invasion or lymphatic invasion, but not um, growth outside the lymphatic space. I'll show you a, some, a picture in a minute of lymphatic invasion, um, which now in retrospect using this definition may, should, perhaps should have been considered a satellite. So I'll be interested if anyone has any um, a better understanding of this, they can comment during questions. But um, to me, you can certainly get intralymphatic intra deposits that are greater than 0 0.05 millimeters, but to me I would call that lymphatic invasion and not a microsatellite. And the, uh, I'll show you, an, when we go through one example at the end, we'll see how that distance of 0 0.3 should be used in order to determine if a deposit is an extension of the primary lesion or a true microsatellite. So here's an example of a piece of melanoma deep to um, the main primary site. You can see the deposit there. It's almost down in the fat. So. Remember what I was saying is you don't include that in the Breslow thickness because if you define that as a microsatellite, then it's already a end stage T, uh, N2C lesion. So don't include that in the Breslow thickness. And I suppose in some of these, you can see some of the problems. Is this attached to a follicle? There's a lot of hair follicles here. And you maybe need a few levels to assure yourself that this was not um, attached to or coming off a follicle. But it's a good example of a deep microsatellite as opposed to a um, one off the periphery. My advice would be to really pay attention when we're looking at re-excision specimens to scan at low power all the way down to all the fat margins. And sometimes it's really easy to spend our time hunting along the epidermal junction looking for residual in situ melanoma when what's happening at the bottom is a, is a microsatellite that cho totally changes the patient's prognosis. So that's uh, a little tip for looking for microsatellites, low power examination. Okay, uh, I don't think the margins issue is too complicated. If you look at the CAP checklist, it goes through how to report the peripheral margin and the deep margin. Um, most of the time they're talking about reporting margins just in excision specimens, and um, I understand that. Um, biopsy specimens, punch biopsies, for example, like this, we know we're going to have positive peripheral margins all the time. Uh, usually punch biopsies do not have a deep margin positive unless it's a really deep, deep nodular tumor. Shave biopsies, on the other hand, can have both peripheral and deep margin involvement. So although the CAP checklist says you don't have to report 
we don't have to report margins on biopsies. I'll tell you why I think it's probably useful. One, um, I think it's useful to, to comment on the deep margin um, because when it's a partial biopsy, that one of the questions we'll be asked is the deep margin involved. In other words, is the Breslow thickness that you're measuring on that biopsy accurate? And secondly, when we sign out the re-excision specimens, I always find it really useful to know whether the original biopsy encompassed the entire lesion. So when I look back at the original biopsy report and it says shave biopsy and the margins are negative by 0.2 millimeters or 1 millimeter, then I know I'm unlikely to be looking for residual primary melanoma. I'm looking for residual in situ disease maybe or satellite disease, but it makes it a lot more, um, you, know, you spend a lot less time sweating over little things when you realize the primary lesion was already removed. So we don't have to report, we don't have to report margins on the biopsies, but I think the deep margin is important and, um, especially if they're, um, not obviously partial biopsies, but you think the clinician was trying to do an excisional biopsy, so there's no harm in reporting the peripheral and deep margins on those biopsy specimens. Okay, so those are the big ones, um, the prognostic indicators and the margins. So let's just move on to, um, the less important, if you will, um, parts of the protocol. That doesn't mean they're not important for melanoma prognosis and for future research and for database and for cancer registries, but they're not directly involved in the staging. So histologic subtypes you are all well aware of, and I won't go through them. I think this is all going to change for us, isn't it, in the next five years or so, because most of the histologic subtypes are associated with specific uh, genetic abnormalities. So Intermittent sun exposure on the trunk, superficial spreading melanoma often have BRAF mutations, chronic sun exposure, lentical malignant melanoma, cell cycle abnormalities, and acromelanoma, some of which have kit mutations. So, as you know, a lot of these have specific therapies coming online for these mutations and, um, and their um, ill-functioning signaling pathways or cell cycle pathways. And so I think, yeah, we can certainly classify them as certain types of melanoma, but in the end, I would imagine will be asked for mutational status on these melanomas and not whether they're superficial spreading or incolentigenous. One thing that's not in the CAP protocol, which is unusual, is um, the, 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 we don't have to comment on desmoplasia. As you know, there's a subtype of melanoma, desmoplastic melanoma. Um, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines do include it. They say it should be recorded in the pathology report if there's pure desmoplasia present. In other words, it's the dominant dermal component. Apparently, uh, one of the, some studies, it's not completely clear, but pure desmoplastic melanoma has a better prognosis than, than if it's only a small component of melanoma, but it does require a, a wide margin to re to excise it completely because of its infiltrative and ill-defined nature. But I'll just point out, although I think that's worth mentioning if it's a predominant subtype in your histologic classification, that's where it would fit in the CAP guideline. We don't have to make a specific comment on desmoplasia. Some vascular invasion. <clears throat> Here's the example I was talking about where there's uh, tumor filling lymphatics. That focus there on the left-hand picture is certainly bigger than 0.05 millimeters, so does that constitute a microsatellite when it's all intralymphatic? Um, not totally clear on that. <clears throat> At the moment, I would be calling that uh, a vascular invasion or lymphatic invasion. The protocol doesn't specifically talk about angiotropism, but there's been lots of good literature on this recently where melanoma is tracking down the outside of lymphatic endothelium and, and still can create um, problems with local regional control for sure because it, you end up with satellite and in-transit metastasis as it tracks down the sheath of the, um, of the lymphatics. So I think it's as part of your lymphascular invasion, if there's angiotropism, in other words, melanoma on the outside of cussing lymphatics, I would comment on that under the limb vascular invasion heading. Perineural invasion, not prognostically important, but probably may have a um, relationship to recurrence rate and problems with clearing the margins. That uh, needs to be reported. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, uh, representative of the immune response to a tumor, um, basically classify them as brisk, non-brisk, or absent. Um, and here's the patterns of brisk in order to classify something as brisk, where the lymphocytes surround the entire advancing edge of the melanoma, as in the left-hand panel, or uh, completely infiltrate throughout 
diffusely throughout the melanoma as in the uh, right-hand panel. Anything else with lymphocytes in is non-brisk, and, uh, and um, the, the remainder would be absent. Most of the cases we see are usually non-brisk or absent. It's sort of this, pro this pronounced lymphocytic response is relatively unusual, at least in my experience. Uh, tumor regression is part of the checklist. Uh, remember, regression needs to involve both the epidermal and situ component and the dermal component. So not just dermal regression, but complete regression. Uh, and it's what you remember, scarring, fibrosis, vascular proliferation, melanophages, and inflammation. Um, the main issue with regression, of course, is in shallow lesions where we might be underestimating the Breslow thickness. And there's some evidence that Regression in T1 lesions is a bad prognostic indicator, even though it's not, it's still T1. And we'll see that some uh, centers would go on to additional investigation, including sentinel lymph node biopsy if there was extensive regression in a thin lesion. The growth phase um, certainly was uh, more discussed probably 10 or 15 years ago in the Clark and Elder model and prognostic indicators, but I think you'll see it kind of matches with, in many ways, with the uh, mitotic rate as an indicator of T1B lesions. Um, growth phase refers to uh, a tumorigenic potential in the dermis. So a vertical growth phase melanoma is forming a tumor in the dermis, whereas a radial growth phase melanoma may have a dermal component, but it's, it's small and it's, it's all superficial and it's spreading radially, quote unquote. Really, there's lots of ways to define these two, but here's the simple way I do. You can take it or leave it. But when the dermal nests are larger than the junctional nests, it's vertical growth phase. That means it's growing preferentially in the dermis. And if you find a mitosis in the dermal component, it's, um, it's a uh, vertical growth phase. Now, although we're not using Clark level, as soon as you get a Clark level 3 lesion, that means the dermis is filled uh, with melanoma, papillodermis is completely expanded and filled. That means it's tumorigenic vertical growth phase. So the only time you're having trouble with growth phase is in a Clark level 2 lesion with some cells in the papillary dermis trying to decide. And the quickest way is to look at the size of the nest and are there any mitoses. Well, I guess additional pathologic findings is to include anything uh, coincident lesions would be the most common, I would think. And the most common one of those is, is, a, is a nevus, um, either an incidental nevus uh, pretty common in, for example, lentigo malignant melanoma, you also find nevi off in the periphery, or underlying nevi, like in this case, where you've got uh, some early invasive melanoma and underlying looking congenital nevus uh, below it. And that's just a, a comment, really. In, your, in our report, we just say um, coincident or uh, benign intradermal nevus. And we've talked about how that can present problems with Breslow thickness, et cetera. Okay, so let's, uh, looking at our time, let's move on to lymph nodes to finish off. Um, if the patient presents with large lymph nodes or, or metastasis on ultrasound, then it's, it's, it's a macro metastasis, but we're often, of course, looking at sentinel lymph node biopsies, so the patient doesn't have uh, clinical metastatic disease, but we look at a sentinel lymph node biopsy to uh, determine if there's Mets in the node, and those would be called micrometastasis. So that's the role of us, our, our role as a pathologist examining sentinel lymph nodes to try to determine if micrometastases are present. Well, why, why do clinicians do sentinel lymph node biopsy? Um, as you know, it's a very important prognostic variable because it changes the, um, the staging and it allows the stratification much, much better for patients into clinical trial groups than we had before. But it, at the moment, we don't have a lot of good evidence that it's going to affect its patient outcome. So if the tumor is uh, T1B tumor or higher, then most many centers would go ahead or talk to the patient about doing sentinel lymph node biopsy. And there's some centers that would do a sentinel lymph node biopsy or at least recommend it or discuss it with the patient for T1A lesions if there's some adverse prognostic features. And this is where some of the other things we were reporting that aren't part of the staging might become important, such as lymphascular invasion or Clark level or extensive regression. So there's just some examples where, and that's very center specific, you know, it depends what the oncologists and the surgeons are, or what their evidence-based approach to this is, but those are some of the examples you might get for, for um, melanomas where they're going to talk to the patient about sentinel lymph nodes. So if we get a sentinel lymph node biopsy and you go, we go back and look at the original pathology report and it says 
uh, you know, it's a T1A lesion and you're saying, why are they doing this? Have a look at maybe one of these higher risk um, things. And just to come back to remember our beginning, we talked about positive deep margins. That's one example where, so if I say it's a 0.85 millimeter melanoma transected at base, at least 0.85 millimeters, that might be one where they discuss sentinel lymph node biopsy with a patient because they're not sure if it's over a millimeter and actually a T2 lesion. So for sentinel lymph node biopsy, we do need to have a protocol to examine the nodes, and that protocol has to include <coughs> immunohistochemistry. It has to include one uh, melanoma-specific, quote-unquote, marker like HMB45 or melanin. I'm just showing you an example of the protocol we use. Um, if you look at, for example, the MD Anderson protocol, it's, it's uh, one where they basically look at the, they put a bisect or uh, red loaf to lobe as much, uh, the node as much as possible, so as many sections on one slide as they can, and look at the H&E first. And if it's negative, they go on and do deeper levels and um, LNA, HMB45 staining. We here happen to do a protocol that's similar to the old Augsburg protocol. It's, um, we do H&E, F100 H&E, two immunos, and another H&E at step sections right up front, and those, those come for each of the sentinel, sentinel lymph nodes. This is what the CAP protocol uh, asks us to do. We have to uh, determine the number of sentinel nodes examined, um, the total number of those examined, so if there's some non-sentinel nodes, which often can be submitted at the same time, number of nodes with metastases, and then whether there's extra nodal extension, how big the metastatic focus is, and where it's located within the lymph node. So the location and the size seem to have a relationship to risk of regional node involvement. So I don't think it's stopping the surgeons from going ahead in trials anyway, from doing completion lymphadenectomies. But if you have one node with a small subcapsular deposit, the risk of having other nodes in the basin involved when you do a completion dissection are low, like 5%. As you can see, as, as you have parenchymal lymph node involvement or extensive lymph node involvement, it goes to as high as 25% of other nodes within the, the basin um, being positive. So this is the reason we're being asked to report the, um, the architectural distribution and size of nodal metastases. So what's the threshold for defining nodal micromets? Well, unlike in breast, there isn't any. Um, so any, any, any melanoma cell just in a node is considered to have a worse prognosis. So even isolated melanoma cells constitute a positive node, uh, unlike in breast cancer. And the big change uh, for us as pathologists is that in the past we would we had to try to confirm that as best as we could on H&E, which as you know with these step sections you'd often one or two cells wouldn't be on the H&E and they would show up in the HMB45. Now all you need to have is positivity with either one of HMB45 or melan A in a cell that looks like melanoma on the immuno slide and it doesn't have to be on the H&E slide. So that's a change from before and that constitutes a positive note. So here's extra capsular extension. Um, should be reporting that um, on all, especially more in the regional lymph node dissections is where we're going to see it, but it's important. And the call you're going to get if we don't report it is from the radiation oncologist because often for local control, extra capsular extension for a lot of cancers, certainly melanoma, means they get uh, local regional radiotherapy. There are some pitfalls, obviously, in sentinel lymph node biopsy interpretation. The two main ones are immunopositive cells that aren't actually melanocytes, or certainly not melanoma, and then also nodal melanocytic nevi. And the presence of nodal nevi is fairly common in melanoma sentinel lymph nodes, and it's probably the main reason why a lot of the molecular techniques, for sensitive techniques for detecting metastasis aren't going to work, because we'll pick up false positives with these nodal nevi. So F100 immunostaining is not in a lot of protocols, and the reason it's in ours here and that I like it is it's a really nice, quick screen. Of course, you have to realize that there's lots of cells in the nodes that are positive, like antigen-presenting cells in the follicles, like on the left, or a nerve on the right. But you can, just in a quick screen, you can pick out clusters of cells, like this cluster at the bottom, that are clearly more epithelioid looking and F100 positive and represent metastatic melanoma. So it's a nice, quick screen a faster screen than, than looking through uh, three sections of, an eight, of, uh, of a node on one slide on H&E to see whether there's anything obvious, uh, including capsular nevi. In fact, it's probably the fastest way to detect benign nevi. Uh, 
we also find cells in the lymph node that look a little bit like almost like a mast cell or a macrophage that are that stain with melanin A or, and or HMB45. Sometimes they're obviously macrophages, like on the left, ingesting pigment. So remember, melanin A and HMB45 are against antigens in the melanosome, and fragments of melanosome probably get transferred and to uh, macrophages and melanophages and go to lymph nodes. So you can get the sort of granular positivity every now and again in macrophages. And other ones almost look more lymphocyte-like, although they have more cytoplasm and stain around them, a bit like a fried egg. And if, if the morphology in the cells that you can tell just on the uh, immunostain is completely benign, uh, you need to discount. We need to discount those as, as non-melanoma cells. Caps are nevi, they said, are common. Here's an example in the capsule of this lymph node. But you can get nevi extending down the tr into the node along trabecula, which keep in mind that this is actually all nodal nevus here, not melanoma. And sometimes even within the parenchyma, so small cells within the parenchyma. And here's the mLNA within the parenchyma of the node showing nodal nevus. This is the one time where I think uh, HMB45 is pretty helpful. Almost all nodal nevi are HMB45 negative. It's very rare exceptions. And if you're really stuck, you can try um, a proliferation marker like TI67, uh, especially if you do it with a double stain, so you can tell that it's in a melanin A positive cell, and that should be very low or essentially absent in a nevus versus melanoma. And those are the, the two tricks. But most of the time, caps or nevus can be distinguished down the microscope from metastatic melanoma. So we come back to the lymph node reporting. Here's an example. There's two sentinel lymph nodes submitted. Um, uh, total nodes examined two. Number with nets one. No, no, no extra nodal extension. Largest focus 0 0.4 in a subcapsular location. And that would be a complete sentinel lymph node report. Okay, so let's just finish off. Um, <clears throat> this is the summary of changes with the AJCC 7th edition, the important ones. The main one is mitotic rate. Um, not only is it an important prognostic factor, um, but it's important for this T1B classification. Um, nodal micromets can be defined either on h &E or just immuno alone, and there's no lower threshold uh, for how big the micromets have to be. And those are the main changes from the, uh, the previous edition of the staging. And uh, here's again back to our primary cutaneous melanoma protocol. And just to remind ourselves that the four, um, the four main things you just got to have in those reports are residual thickness, ulceration, mitotic index, and the presence or absence of satellites, and then, uh, and then margins um, all have to be in the protocol. And, of course, uh, I'll show you an example now in a minute, but you also add the pathologic staging component the, um, the tumor classification and nodal classification, if you have it, to your CAP checklist. So I just thought I'd show you a case to finish. Uh, this is yesterday's sign-out, so fresh off the press. 75-year-old um, Mayo, left shin. Uh, the clinical history was query melanoma, and a deep shade biopsy was performed, and the clinician, uh, the dermatologist, she told me that she'd only sampled approximately one-third of a lesion. So. You know, that's, that's useful information. Sometimes you don't get that at all. So she's clearly tried to sample the thickest part of the lesion. It's an unusual case, rather a nevoid melanoma with a, a, a very um, irregular, large, sort of serpiginous nest in the dermis that don't quite fit with benign nevus, and this is all invasive melanoma. So here's a higher power of that invasive component, and you can see, um, well, one of the major problems right away is what's this little piece down here? And is that, a, is that uh, the deepest component? Is that where I measure my Breslow thickness, or is that a microsatellite? It's certainly apart from the main mass, um, but it looks like there's norm and it looks like there's normal dermis between the two. So you have, we have to measure how far that is, and the distance here is only 0 0.15 millimeters. So that's not, by definition, a microsatellite because it's too close to the main mass. It has to be 0 0.3 millimeters at least from the main, um, the main mass. So we're going to be including that now in our Breslow thickness. Now, I've, here's the Breslow thickness I measured on this case, 1.03. And you can, you can look at this and say, hold on, Trotter. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to measure that. It's how you swing that arrow around, isn't it? And what's perpendicular to the surface? You know, it's a curving surface. And it's, it's really complicated, I think. This is one where you can see I'm really on the cusp of, of a, a T1A lesion versus, uh, or T1 lesion versus a T2 lesion. Uh, 
Anyway, my decision was it was it was over a millimeter, and therefore it's a T2A lesion. So, you know, in fact, you could stop now. Um, we have the Breslow thickness, and we have um, it's a it's a partial biopsy, so we're gonna we can't tell if there's satellites, and we know this none none around here. We've looked at them, and um, we we know the depth. You know, mitotic rate is an important prognostic variable. It doesn't matter in T2A. But let's let's pretend it's a T1A and have a look at what, how we measure mitosis in this lesion. So, in this field here, um, I found uh, I found two mitotic figures. I couldn't on low power screening find any anywhere else in the tumor. So that was my hot spot. And there's the two mitotic figures in that in that focus. They're just located uh, there and there. So that was two. And now what we what we do is we follow the protocol is we measure that field first. That's, there's the two mitotic figures and, and my microscope four high power fields equal a millimeter squared roughly. So I measured four of those and didn't find any more. So I this is I think where we talk about this mitotic. I don't I don't have to go ahead and measure the whole tumor and divide by the number of high power fields to get a millimeter squared. Um, we just have to measure four. And so this is two mitoses per millimeter squared. So here's the sign out of that melanoma, just the, the first part of the important stuff. It's a partial shave biopsy. That's the procedure. It's on the left side. It's on the shin. Um, maximum thickness 1.03, ulceration, non-identified margins. Now, here's why I talked about margins before. It's a biopsy only because I know it's a partial biopsy, but I did say how far the deep component was from the deep margin. So the invasive component down here at the bottom of this melanoma was 0.15 from the paint's margin. Um, mitotic index microsatellites not identified. We need to decide, depending on the size of the biopsy, whether we're going to say cannot assess or not identified. This is a big enough biopsy. There's places far enough from the tumor that I don't see any. Doesn't mean there won't be some in the wide excision, but there's none that I can see here. And the pathologic staging is P2A. So uh, if you don't have uh, a synoptic checklist online in your lab information system. I would certainly recommend either building or making yourself one that you can tick off or downloading one from CAP. Uh, CAP one is co totally complete there on the left and very useful for making sure everything is covered as a, as a checklist when we sign these cases out. So thanks very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Um, this is the Dermpath Group in Calgary. I'd like to thank them for their, their help and support with this talk. And um, that's it. Happy to answer any questions and looking forward to some more discussion on those problematic areas. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for that, uh, that excellent talk. Um, we don't see any questions coming up uh, as of yet. Um, I wonder if you could comment, though, on the issue of the uh, when you have a, a biopsy specimen and you have a further re-excision and you find additional information in the re-excision in regards to the sort of final assessment of uh, uh, of stage for TNM, so that happens sometimes. Another issue re regarding re-excisions re as well is that uh, often the re-excisions are done in a hospital sector, whereas the biopsies might have been done in a private or commercial laboratory, and it's sometimes difficult for the pathologist with the re-excision specimen to get that information to sort of make a final assessment of the case level stage and other uh, other prognostic factors. So I wonder if you can comment on the the addition of the biopsy and the re-excision information. Yeah, sure. Um, the, uh, we'll start first, I think, with this issue of when you have residual invasive melanoma in the, in the re-excision specimen. So the partial, say you have a shave biopsy in the transects, the bottom, and you have residual melanoma. The rule is we don't add the two together. So, um, in other words, you would measure the depth on the on the um, re-excision specimen, and if it's more than the uh, the depth reported on the shave biopsy, then that's the final depth. The understanding of you know scarring and things above the site, depending on how long the time between biopsy and excision, do influence that. But the rule is not to add the two together. So um, my approach to re-excisions is is at least on the checklist to, to completely go through the prognostic indicators again, and um, if and, and report at least a um, at least the ones that affect staging again, with a note of whether or not they're upstaging or downstaging the disease. So I don't add the P classification. Let's say, for example, the original melanoma was 1.2. On the re-excision, there was some residual melanoma at 
um, and everything else was the same, I would say this 0.4, but this is less than the original biopsy, which is 1.2, and doesn't uh, affect or upstage this lesion. I think the main thing, as I said in, in the re-excisions, is to be definitive about the microsatellites as best you can, and, and they, need, they need to be included in all of them. So, I mean, the most common scenario many of us will see is a re-excision specimen with no melanoma in it. Nothing, no in situ, no invasion, no uh, satellites, um, completely removed on the excisional biopsy, and of course those are easier to sign out, but they always need to include negative for invasive melanoma or negative for residual melanoma, negative for satellite lesions, and that negative for satellite lesions is, is a requirement, needs to be in there. So um, I think that's probably the main differences uh, between the two, John. The important one is not to add add the breast low thicknesses together to, um, to sum them up. Okay, hey, oh, wonderful. We've got a few questions coming in now, Martin. Uh, we've got one from Rock Robertson. Uh, if a melanoma which is completely ex if, if a melanoma which is completely excised and a re-excision of the site is done, this, does this in any way interfere with sentinel lymph node identification? So the wide excision is done um, prior to any um, dye injection or radio tracer injection. Um, not that uncommon problem either. Um, yeah, the, the it, most of the evidence would suggest it does not. In other words, if you're back into that wide excision site relatively early uh, with the dye radio tracer injection, then it will go to the appropriate lymph node. Um, if any plastics is done, like rotation flaps or anything, that screws everything. So that's no good. But um, in many centers, they can go ahead with sentinel lymph node biopsy um, if the wide excision is done say, by a surgeon who doesn't do sentinel lymph node biopsies, but the oncologists still want it done. So, yeah, there's, there's a potential to interfere, but most evidence suggests you can go ahead with sentinel lymph node biopsy even after the wide excision specimen. Okay, you got a couple of questions from Paul Medline in Toronto. Uh, first question, what is the point of counting more than one mitotic figure if it won't change the stage? Well, uh, yeah, I, I have sympathy with that question. Um, it's, it's just because it's part of the database from the prognosis worsens. In other words, the three cutoffs are zero, one to six, and greater than six for prognos for mitotic figures, arbitrary cutoffs. The more mitotic figures you have, the worse the prognosis, but at the present time, he's absolutely correct, you don't change the stage. So, um, in other words, what's important is just count the millimeter squared. Don't, we don't have to count more than that. So, yeah, if there's one mitosis, uh, find that one and count the three or four fields around it and just give, it, give that total, three, one, five, whatever it happens to be. Absolutely correct. One mitosis in the dermis is the only thing that changes the stage for those T1 lesions. And for the T2 and above, it doesn't have any effect on the um, tumor classification. We have another comment from Paul. Uh, he says, I think it is very dangerous to call positive lymph nodes on immunostains alone. You are subjecting a patient to chemotherapy for what could be an intradermal nevus. Or, sorry, an intranodal nevus. Yeah, um, I understand that concern. Certainly, we, we certainly struggle with uh, small groups and single cells. The location is pretty crucial. I mean, the example I showed you of parenchymal nevus, intraparenchymal nevus, is really rare. Um, almost all, well, a large majority of nevi are capsular. They're in the capsule. And um, so although there's lymphatics in the capsule that can contain melanoma, melanoma is subcapsular. So the location really does help. Um, and HMB45, positive cells in a subcapsular location, even though there's two or three of them, are not going to be needless almost for sure because they're wrong location and they're expressing HMB45. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a big concern. Certainly, I think it's less of a concern doing immuno and making that call than it is uh, obviously using PCR and saying that there's, there's melanocyte, melanocytic uh, marker within the lymph node. But yeah, we, we sweat, everybody sweats over those one or two cells all the time and what to call them. And I'm sure the oncologists and the surgeons have major discussions with the patients. And, we know some patients that say, no, I don't, I don't think that's enough, and I'm not going ahead with anything, and others say they're going to go ahead, so it becomes a bit of a conference. 
Okay, there's a, a sort of a compound question from Dr. Gazarian, uh, UHN. Uh, the first part, he said he would like a number of issues addressed. The first one is mitosis, or I guess mitotic counting versus KI-67. Well, I mean, the, there's small studies that say that uh, Key 67 and or phosphorylated histone H3 are more accurate and correlate better with prognosis, but they're compared to the numbers of thousands and thousands and thousands in the AJCC data, uh, they're not mature yet. Um, I mean, that's true for a lot of a lot of tumors, isn't it? Should we be using a, a mitotic marker like uh, like a histone marker rather than um, rather than visual inspection on H&E because it's more sensitive. So um, I'm, there, it's possible that the data at one point find you can do KI-67 and do that rate just as quick, but at the moment, mitotic rate has most of the data and, and works. So um, there's only one or two papers that would suggest that the additional staining offers anything uh, of more prognostic accuracy than the mitotic count itself. And then there's another question he's asking it, to comment on the issue of deep invasion from lateral peripheral margin. Not sure I quite understand that myself. Yeah, I'm not sure I do either. Um, I'm not maybe if you have a chance to, to just write in again what exactly what he means by that. I'm not sure, sorry. And uh, another comment from him is that regression is not well defined. That's true. <laughs> no argument there. <laughs> and then finally, there's another question from, from Dr. Gazarian. Can you comment on the role of Clark's level in melanoma of the ear? No. <laughs> okay. uh, other than from, I mean, Clark's level, the surgeons still want Clark's level, right? Although it may not be included in the, in the classification anymore, it really helps them decide on depth and you know, when you're talking about the ear of whether you're removing cartilage or anything like that, so, um, and nose and other places like that. But apart from that, uh, that's, I, I still always report Clark level, and it's part of the CAP checklist, so you report it, but I, I'm not, um, I'm not sure, at least I haven't had any experience with surgeons that are specifically asking for more information with regarding to ear melanomas. Okay, there's a question now from uh, from Dr. Russell Price and Barry. Uh, we have been asked by dermatologists to measure multiple margins around a melanoma, superior, inferior, medial, lateral. Our usual practice is to measure the one closest margin and report only this one. What is your advice? I agree with you. I mean, the, the closest margin is the one that's driving their re-excision and their adequacy if they have to re-excise, um, not, not necessarily the other ones, although... If they're all too short, I can see, or too too small, I can see the problem. Remember, um, most skin skin um, in addition to fixation shrinkage, which is relatively minor, skin shrinks a lot because of elastic contraction, and you know the clinical margin, um, except for those difficult, uh, you know, lentigo malignant and subtle melanomas, the clinical margin is probably more accurate in many ways than our in terms of real true anatomic margin in situ than our uh, our measurement down the microscope because we we are always reporting smaller margins than they think they've taken. Um, I can I understand their point if, if there's a lot of close margins and they want to know do they have to go not only wider on the lateral side and if they're getting to that they need some kind of staged excision anyway. It's getting you know, they they were too close in the first place. That can happen of course on facial lesions where there's there's uh, Circumferential margins being examined, either you know, most techniques or something like that, where they're asking for different information. But I agree with their observation that the closest margin is the one that needs to be reported, and and that's where the wide excision has to be further excision has to be based on that margin. Okay, we have a question from Paul Medline. Uh, uh, if sentinel lymph node biopsy is not the standard of care, why is it in the CAP guidelines? Because it's the College of American Pathologists. Um, if it was, uh, if it was the UK, I, I don't, you know, uh, it's, I think it's, it's considered standard of care in the in the US. It doesn't mean it's evidence based, but it's it's uh, because the MSLT2 trial is not complete, and there's some subgroup analysis that suggests it is going to have 
I mean, the, the question, it's partly philosophical. It comes down, it's a, prognos- it's a really strong prognostic marker, isn't it? And there is some risks, um, but they're pretty minor, a little bit higher in groin node versus axillary node. Um, and that's why, in many cases, even discuss with the patient, what do you want to do? There's a chance your arm could swell, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I'm assuming it's because it's, it's driven by the American system, the CAP, the CAP guidelines. Okay. Now, we have another question coming. I'm not sure exactly who it's from. Uh, Sandy is the name. But the question is as follows. Is staging of acral melanoma the same? Uh, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. There's, there's differences in, in some staging issues with mucosal, like vulvar melanoma, but acral melanoma should be staged the same way. As the cutane, it's included in the cutaneous group. You know, we got we got a further clarification of that question from Danny Gazarian. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's asking, this is in regards to the deep invasion from lateral peripheral margin, saying deep invasion or any invasion should be measured from the lateral peripheral margin. In terms of the thickness, we'd always measure from the epidermis, so I'm not sure measure, measuring from the, where the margin is. I'm not, I don't understand that. I'm still not quite getting it. I mean, if it's to determine how thick it is, it's always going to be from the epidermis and not from a margin. But I must be I must be misinterpreting Danny's question. Sorry. Uh, and then there's another comment from uh, uh, from Danny here uh, saying that sentinel lymphoblastic biopsy is the standard of care in Ontario. It's good. I, I guess it isn't in Alberta or BC. <laughs> oh no, I think. Uh, I think most patients are, and they're all seen in southern Alberta in one cancer center, and they're offered, if appropriate, sentinel lymph node biopsy. You know, so it's not like people are being missed. I, I would say if, if that's your definition of standard of care, then it is in Alberta too. That's all the questions we've had so far. So if there's anybody else that wants to send a question, better do it real quick because we're going to wrap this up, uh, I think, right about now. Uh, so I just make, make a few closing remarks. Um, on behalf of uh, Cancer Care Ontario, the partnership and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would really like to thank Martin Schroeder for a truly comprehensive, informative, and a very clear presentation today. This is our fourth uh, teleconference in the second series of the CAP checklist presentations, and we, we would welcome your comments and suggestions for ways to ensure these sessions are uh, informative, relevant to your practice and how we can improve them in the future. Please include your feedback and suggestions as part of the completed online evaluations. Once the WebEx recording of the presentation becomes available, it will be made available for wide distribution via links through Cancer Care Ontario, the partnership, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists. Access to this recording will be available for review at your convenience and is not restricted. As a reminder, both the live and recorded presentations are eligible for continuing education credits, in order to receive, receive the CME credits for attending or viewing the educational sessions, you must complete an evaluation form for each session accessed or viewed in entirety. The link to the web-based survey has been included in the session notices distributed prior to each of these sessions. If you are not able to access, access the web-based evaluation, please contact Sarah, Sarah Lankshire at sara dot l-a-n-k-s-h-e-r-a at cancercare.on.ca to request a copy of the evaluation form to be mailed to you. This information was also included on the notice distributed prior to the session. Please note CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education sessions will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. The sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, but the certificates will only be issued for one month. Please refer to the session notice for the exact deadline date. Also, please note that the information for each education session is distributed 10 days prior to the session date and are distributed via via CPAC, the Ontario Association of Pathologists, and the Canadian Association of Pathology distribution list and websites. Please check these sources for session information. Uh, Our next presentations of the next presentation will actually be on January the 26th at the same time, and this is going to be on urinary bladder. It's going to be given by Dr. Theo Vanderquist. So thank you very much for attendance uh, in this uh, this uh, uh, teleconference sponsored by CPAC, Cancer Care Ontario, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists. And that's it for now.